So yeah. we are very happy today to have Dr. Aaron Shafflin with us from the University of Pennsylvania. He received his PhD in public policy from University of California at Berkeley, one of my favorite places. Um, his MA in Interna International and Developmental Economics from Yale and his BS in Industrial and Labor Relations from Cornell. So a very stellar educational background. And he has taken that to the next level with his publications and his awards over the past few years. His current research focuses on a very hot topic in society today, policing the preferences of police officers, place-based crime prevention, and also the determinants of crime victimization. He uses all his training in, in economics to bring new and um, sophisticated techniques to his research. And he's won awards in 2021. He won the best paper award for an early career scholar um, from criminology and public policy. The year before he won the outstanding young experimental criminologist award from applied economics and the list goes on and on. I was reading through the list of papers in progress uh, that you have, Aaron, and I want to read all of them. Um, but thankfully, today you will be presenting on one of them to us. You'll be presenting on the professional motivations of police officers, I believe. Yep. And without further ado, I want to turn the session over to you. Well, thanks, Megan, for the introduction. Uh, I think if my mother heard that, she'd be very proud. Um, but uh, no, this is my favorite one of the working papers that that that's on the CV. Uh, it's a paper I've been working on for oh, five, six years now, so too long, um, but we're really uh, about now. And so if anyone has questions or feedback, uh, this sort of the point uh, along the um, production function of the paper that, that that's become really, really valuable to us. Um, so uh, uh, this is really a project that is an attempt to get under the hood a little bit and try to understand what makes police officers tick, right? So Police officers are, are kind of the street level bureaucrats in our criminal justice system. They're the ones um, out there uh, making policy uh, with or without um, formal policy uh, or, or changes in law. And so I think it's it's worth trying to understand, you know, what is it that that uh, motivates them? You know, what are their preferences like? Uh, and so specifically, we're going to be focused on trying to figure out um, how officers value what we think of as their professional motivations versus non-work activities like you know leisure time and in particular to what extent their behavior on the job is potentially distorted by, by financial incentives that they face uh, on the job which is a question that uh i think is uh you know uh, generated a lot of interest in recent years and we're going to try to answer those questions using a couple of uh tactically selected natural experiments um so project joint with Felipe and Salvis, uh who's at UCLA um and, uh, you know, I know Felipe will also be grateful for your feedback. Um, okay, well, let's see if I can advance the slide. There we go. So, so broadly speaking, uh, I think there's, you know, accumulating evidence that the work of uh, law enforcement, criminal justice agencies can be distorted by financial incentives. Uh, police departments change their enforcement of traffic tickets when fiscal conditions are tight. Uh, drug arrests tend to rise when asset forfeiture laws empower police to keep more of of uh, the assets that they seize. Uh, there's examples uh, outside of policing um, as well. So I think we have some, some reasonable evidence at the institutional level that institutions tend to respond to financial incentives, but how about the officers themselves? And our reading of the literature is that the state of knowledge remains pretty anecdotal. So we've, we've read a lot of uh, police ethnographies, um, but we, we haven't really seen quantitative evidence uh, on this. And so that, that's sort of our motivation to start to provide some. Uh, so we're going to draw on a natural experiment um, and some really good data. Uh, I, I think everyone probably says, you know, I've got great data. No one ever gives a talk and says my data is like, you know, sort of the 50th percentile. But but we really have good data uh, here. And we're going to try to develop a deeper understanding of, of police uh, behavior and police uh, preferences. Um, ultimately, we want to try to figure out, are police professionally motivated? Um, and it's going to be a little subtle. Uh, it depends on what you mean by uh, professionally uh, motivated. Um, so I mentioned that we're going to uh, exploit a natural experiment, uh, really two natural experiments that are that are kind of closely uh, tied to each other. And I'll start by pointing out that the financial reward for making a late shift arrest uh, is higher 
because those arrests are more likely to lead to overtime pay. So uh, in some police circles, this is an idea known as uh, collars for dollars. So the collar being the arrest, uh, the dollars being the uh, overtime pay. Uh, it's a concern that we've seen come up in a lot of news stories uh, recently. Uh, you know, more specifically, the idea here is that police might make especially uh, low value arrests, maybe uh, in a racially motivated way at the very end of their shift so that they can collect uh, some overtime pay. Uh, it's a concern that showed up in the Mullen Commission report, which famously addressed police uh, corruption in New York City uh, in the 1970s. Uh, but this idea also was fairly prominent in the Ferguson report, uh, you know, the DOJ uh, made uh, on policing in Ferguson, Missouri. And so ultimately, um, do officers take advantage of this financial incentive, right? And, and we think that the answer to this question uh, can start to unpack a little bit um, what the preferences of police officers uh, look like. Um, so here's a couple of headlines uh, that we pulled for some, from some recent uh, news coverage about this, right? You can see NYPD officers accused of making collars for dollars. Uh, the arrest was a bust. The officers got overtime anyway. Um, innocent caught in web of cops overtime abuse. So this is something that that uh, is being uh, written about uh, recently. Uh, these are all uh, articles that came out within the last couple of years. And so ultimately, we're going to really be trying to sort out these dueling memes of, um, you know, what potentially could describe police behavior. Are police more like Jon Snow, uh, my watch has ended, or are they more like Dwight from The Office? Like, you know, did someone say overtime? Uh, and we're going to try to get uh, a little bit more sophisticated than this, but but that, that feels like a decent starting point. Uh, okay. So we're going to be using data from Dallas, Texas, uh, which makes some really incredible data available to researchers. If anyone in uh, the audience is, is interested in policing and, and wants to get some amazing data at the officer level, at the event level, uh, I would encourage you to send a FOIA request to Dallas. Uh, you know, one of the folks who handles these is a PhD and cares about research. Uh, so um, we've had a really great experience working uh, with, with the DPD. Uh, and so what we're going to be doing here is looking at the effect of an officer's shift hour. So how far into their workday they are uh, on the quantity, the composition, and the quality of arrests that those officers uh, make. And I want to start uh, by just telling you a little bit about policing in Dallas, uh, some institutional features that are going to be useful to us uh, in carrying out this research. Uh, there's more uh, to come. Uh, this is just going to be a couple of things to get us started. Uh, all right. So first, uh, the argument that I'm going to be making uh, when I start to walk through the empirical results is that the time path of officers' arrest activity throughout the day reflects their underlying preferences, what the officer would want to do in a world in which that officer is unconstrained. It's a very big assumption. Uh, it would be very appropriate for you to be skeptical of that assumption. Uh, I hope uh, after I've defended that assumption empirically, you'll you'll uh, warm up to it and, and think that you know maybe um, it's an assumption that's reasonable to make here in this context. Uh, but I'll start by just talking a little bit about some broad institutional features. So officers uh, in Dallas, like many cities, have wide discretion over uh, whether to make an arrest in a lot of circumstances, right? Officers can decide how proactive they want to be in looking for evidence of law breaking. Um, they have to decide whether there's probable cause to make an arrest, which inherently involves a lot of discretion, uh, and they're imperfectly monitored, right? Uh, so officers in practice, uh, you, you can't really see everything they're doing. I guess you can go back and look at their body or in camera footage, but that's uh, you know done fairly rarely. Uh, so second, officers don't get any formal rewards for making an arrest, right? Um, in Dallas, promotions are based entirely on taking a civil service exam. Uh, uh, pay is based purely on rank and, and um, tenure. Uh, so you're not getting uh, more pay for making uh, more arrests. Now, there are informal rewards. You can um, have the respect of your colleagues. It might uh, entitle you to some preference for special units. Uh, so we're not saying that there's no incentive to make arrests in Dallas, but the, the incentives are kind of low powered, maybe compared to uh, other industries. Uh, and then third, uh, we are unaware of any institutional constraints in the taking of overtime. So uh, we've looked carefully at the data, you know, by command, by beat. We've talked to 
uh, command staff in Dallas. We've talked to beat cops in Dallas, and we are unaware of, of any constraint that would uh, cause officers to take less overtime than they otherwise would want to. In fact, informally, we've been told by some sergeants and lieutenants, sometimes they have to like beg officers to take certain types of overtime. Um, okay. So um, how do arrests and practice lead to overtime in Dallas? Uh, with a few exceptions, arrests uh, usually take a while, at least a couple of hours to process. Uh, suspects have to be uh, transported to jail, fingerprinted, booked. Uh, the arresting officers do the transportation. Uh, they sit with the suspect at the jail. They write up the report. Uh, the paperwork's got to be done immediately. You can't sort of say like, you know, I'm going to knock off for the night. I'll do it in the morning. Uh, you've you've got to do it in real time. And so if an officer ends up working beyond his or her regularly scheduled shift, uh, that officer is going to receive 150% of base pay. Uh, so that's mandated by the Fair Labor Standards Act, which has uh, been in federal law for um, 80, 90 years now. Uh, so this is not something that uh, DPD has discretion over. Uh, overall, when you think about the number of hours um, of overtime a typical arrest yields, uh, you're talking about $150 roughly in, in overtime pay on average. Um, so it's about two thirds of an officer's daily base pay. So it's meaningful. If you make a, lift, a late shift arrest, you're boosting your pay for that day by, by quite a bit in, in percentage terms. Okay, so I mentioned that we have rich data uh, and let me uh, sort of qualify what I mean by that. So what I mean is that we can trace an event uh, as it moves through the criminal justice system from the very beginning to the very end. So for every 911 call, uh, I know whether that 911 call led to an arrest, uh, what the arrest was for, ultimately whether there was a conviction, if there was a conviction, what criminal sentence was imposed. Uh, we can use whether a conviction uh, happened, whether a criminal sentence was imposed as proxies for the quality of an arrest. They're imperfect proxies, but uh, you know it's, uh, I think, uh, still a pretty valuable thing to look at. Uh, we can link all of this back to the officer or officers who took the call and the arresting officers. Uh, we also have data on uh, every officer's assigned shift, whether they were working that day, where and when. Um, and we also know whether police officers were performing off-duty work on that day and where they might be working off-duty. So um, that's something I'm going to use later in the talk to um, explore some further points. Uh, if anyone has any questions, by the way, I can't see anyone. I can just uh, see myself in my slides, but but just uh, jump in if there's a question about uh, the data or anything I've said so far. Um, okay, so uh, a couple of quick summary statistics just to give you some background. Uh, Dallas is a diverse uh, police department, um, half non-white, about a fifth female. Uh, on an annual basis, officers uh, who are actively on patrol make about 600. Um, they respond to about 600 911 calls. They make 27 arrests, and about a fifth of those are an arrest for a felony crime. Uh, overall, uh, a little over a third of arrests that officers make lead to a guilty conviction for at least a misdemeanor crime. So many other arrests might end up uh, you know, yielding a violation of, of some kind, we're going to focus mostly on, on arrests that lead to at least a misdemeanor conviction as, uh, you know, kind of being a proxy for something that society feels is sufficiently um, serious um, that it, it rises beyond a civil violation. Uh, so average base pay uh, DPD is about $65,000. Overtime pay is maybe 9% of base pay on average, uh, but there's a, a widespread here. Um, you, as you can see, the min is zero, about half of officers don't uh, work overtime at all, or this particular type of overtime, and a couple of officers earn uh, a lot of overtime. Uh, this audience uh, probably um, uh, would, would guess this already, uh, but about half of the arrests are uh, comprised of these five uh, offense types, so probably not surprising. This is true in Dallas, it's true in virtually every other city I've ever seen data for. Um, okay, so I'm going to start now by sharing some findings. I'll, I'll begin with some basic descriptive findings. I'll then motivate our uh, formal statistical framework and then show you some regression results uh, and get into some of the, the nitty gritty about the assumptions that we're making. Okay, so all of the figures I'm going to show you, uh, and I'm going to show you only figures, uh, no tables, uh, I think, are, are going to have the same format. 
So the x-axis here is the shift hour uh, of the officer's uh, workday. So the minus eight hour is the first hour of the workday. The minus one hour is the final hour of the workday. These guys all work eight hour shifts. There are a small number of DPD officers who work 10 hour shifts. We're just excluding them from the analysis. They do different sorts of work. Uh, the y-axis here is the probability that an arrest made in a given shift hour leads to overtime. And I'm splitting that out by felony and non-felony arrests. And you can see that um, the uh, arrest probability, uh, the overtime probability uh, for a given arrest rises monotonically throughout the day, as we would expect. Arrests made at the end of the day overall have a pretty high probability of leading to uh, some type of overtime pay, about three, three and a half hours uh, on average. So uh, same structure here. Uh, on the left-hand side, the y-axis is the probability that an officer makes an arrest in a given shift hour. And on the, the right-hand side, the figure is the probability that an arrest that's made in a given shift hour leads to a conviction. And so when we just look at the descriptive data, we're kind of seeing the opposite of the collars for dollar story. We're seeing that first arrests start to rise uh, at the beginning of an officer shift, and then they fall. And they fall by about 60% uh, relative to the peak um, arrest rate, uh, about um, three, four hours into an officer shift and three hours in. Uh, the conviction rate is actually rising throughout an officer shift. So at the end of the shift, officers are making fewer arrests and the, and the arrests they're making are more likely to lead to a conviction. So potentially are of higher quality. All right, so that's just descriptive data. There's a million other things that could be going on. Uh, so we we motivate this a little bit more, more formally. Um, so let me uh, show you what we do. So we're going to leverage one other really important institutional feature of policing in Dallas, uh, and that's the fact that there are overlapping shifts. So within a given police command, there's always more, at least one shift of officer, at least two shifts, I should say, of officers that are policing at the same time. So uh, let's say my co-author Felipe and I are both cops uh, in the same uh, Dallas command. Uh, we're policing on the same day. Uh, Felipe might be at the beginning of his shift. I might be at the end of my shift. So we're subject to all of the same external environments, uh, but we face different um, intrinsic incentives uh, on the basis of uh, where in the shift we are. Uh, so we're essentially going to be comparing these officers who face the same crime environment, but just have different um, parts of their workday uh, that they're working in. And so our primary spe specification is just a regression. Uh, the outcome variable here is an indicator for whether uh, an arrest was made by officer I on date T in hour H. Uh, the shift hour coefficients are the uh, shift hour variables are the variables of interest. Uh, the alpha sub K coefficients on those shift hour uh, indicators is going to tell us the time path of uh, arrest activity throughout an officer shift. Uh, we're going to we're going to uh, control for the number of 911 calls made uh, within an officer's division on that date uh, as a proxy for the demand for police service. And then we're going to throw in a lot of fixed effects that are really going to be doing the heavy lifting here to ensure that we're comparing two officers that are facing the same crime environment um, just in, at different points in their workday. So we have officer fixed effects. We have interacted division by day of week by hour of day fixed effects, division by year month, and so on and so forth. Like, I, I don't even want to read all of these because we um, run this with every possible set of interacted fixed effects you can imagine, including a fully saturated set of fixed effects. And the uh, estimates that we get do not change. Uh, the standard errors start to get a little bit bigger when you saturate the model. Uh, but um, in the appendix table, whatever, in the paper, we show you that um, it really doesn't matter. We're seeing um, very, very similar uh, estimates, regardless of what we, uh, what we do. Um, okay. So um, what do we find? Uh, I'm going to begin with um, an analysis that, that's going to shed light on how officers value um, financial rewards uh, and, and with, uh, given you know, their overtime pay versus uh, their leisure time. So when we run this regression, uh, so here the y-axis now is the shift time coefficient. These are the alpha k uh, coefficients from that regression. We're seeing the same thing uh, in the regression that we saw in the descriptive data, that first arrests sort of rise a little bit early in an officer shift, and then they fall. 
Uh, they don't fall by 60% when we control for everything and we use all of our interacted fixed effects and we uh, compare me to Felipe, we're seeing about a 30% fall in arrest activity at the end of the shift relative to peak. Uh, the conviction rate, just as uh, it did in the uh, descriptive data, is rising throughout an officer shift. The college for dollar story would tell you it should fall, that, that lower quality arrests are being made. We see uh, the opposite. Uh, maybe you think the conviction rate is a lousy uh, proxy for arrest quality, uh, and you know I think that's a reasonable perspective to have. Uh, we also do this for the rate at which um, an arrest leads to a criminal sentence, so um, a custodial sentence, to be to be uh, even clearer. And we're seeing that arrests that are made at the end of the day are actually more likely and not less likely to yield a custodial uh, sentence. That's whether or not we control for the arrest type. Uh, the the pattern holds. We can look at this uh, for various uh, types of crime. Uh, so I'm showing you this here for violations, which are really, really low level things, uh, misdemeanors and felonies. The pattern is the same, uh, even for felonies. Uh, the, um, the drop off is larger for violations and misdemeanor crimes where officers have more discretion, but we still see that felony arrest activity drops off at the end of an officer's work day. And again, this is, um, this is not just capturing time of day effects. It's not just like a four o'clock effect where all the kids are out of school and there's more crime uh, because we're comparing officers who are um, you know, working at the same time, just in different parts of their shift. Uh, we can look at racial disparities. Uh, so this is uh, somewhere that Felipe and I thought we might uh, end up seeing something and we don't. Uh, so the share of arrestees who are black, the share of arrestees who are, who are Hispanic is, is pretty much constant throughout the shift. It, it's not rising at the end of the day in the way that uh, some uh, versions of the college for dollar story might suggest that it would be. Uh, so we don't see evidence of that. Um, okay, so this is what we see when we apply our regression, uh, but you might already be thinking about ex uh, alternative uh, explanations here. You know, what else could explain this other than officers' innate preferences? And there, there certainly are some other stories. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a couple of the stories that um, come up most in police ethnographies uh, and when we, we've talked to people. And we have a pretty neat way to rule out that all these stories are um, really what's driving the results. So one possibility is um, I make fewer arrests at the end of my shift because if I make an arrest early in my shift, I'm taken out of circulation, right? I'm, I'm at the precinct or at the jail processing that early arrest. And so of course, just mechanically, my late shift arrests are gonna go down. So that, that could be the case. Uh, second, you might think that officers who are at their end of their shift are gonna be less likely to be routed to 911 calls. Uh, that's certainly what a rational um, law enforcement agency would wanna see done. Um, like wrote, wrote the guy who's at uh, the beginning of a shift, not the guy who's about to go home. Uh, to some extent, this does happen, uh, but it's not explaining our results. So I'll show you this in a second. Uh, and then, you know, something we know happens is arrest trading. So a bunch of officers show up to a scene and arrest is made. And you could say, well, you know, hey, guys, I'm, I'm about to knock off. I'm, I'm going home. Uh, can one of you guys take the collar and write up the write up the report? Uh, that happens, right? Um, that obviously happens. It's not driving our results. Um, so how can I be uh, so sure about this? Uh, so what we do is we say, well, we can focus on the subset of arrests, uh, or, or let me back up. We can focus on 911 calls. So we can focus on the probability that a 911 call led to an arrest. So if an officer takes a 911 call early in his shift, is that call more likely to lead to an arrest than a 911 call taken at the end of an officer shift? And the reason why this analysis is gonna be a test for all three of these stories is that if an officer is literally available to take that 911 call, we know that he's not been incapacitated by an earlier shift arrest. Uh, we know that whatever is done by uh, 911 operators to not route late shift officers to calls, you know, that officer was routed to a call. And then by looking at, um, the probability that an arrest happens, uh, even if just one officer taking that arrest, uh, taking that call uh, was at the end of the shift, we can rule out that arrest trading is driving this because we just know that if one officer was there, was at the end of his or her shift, an arrest is less likely to be made, uh, regardless of who ended up writing up the arrest report. Uh, and so when we, when we do this analysis, so here the y-axis is the shift time coefficient from an analysis where it's the 
um, probability of an arrest given a 911 call, we see the same pattern that, um, that the arrest probability is declining at the end of the day, it's not rising. Um, okay, so um, I've got one more story I can roll out for you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait to do it, uh, but hopefully you're, you find yourself maybe a little bit more convinced now than when I, I started uh, uh, going through the results. Uh, so maybe you, you find yourself convinced that uh, officers really do uh, have an aversion to making late shift arrests. They, they value their leisure time more than they value that amount of money uh, at the margin. Uh, what, what I can't speak to yet, what, what I want to speak to uh, now, is how do officers value uh, financial rewards um, versus um, uh, job considerations, like wanting to do a good job as a police officer? And so what we're going to do here is we're going to appeal to another uh, closely related natural experiment that is going to shift, essentially, the cost of making an arrest. Now, we don't have any direct variation in the cost of making an arrest at the end of the shift because overtime pay is fixed. It's mandated under federal law. It's not like the department can say, well, you know, we negotiated a new union contract and instead of time and a half, it's going to be time and a quarter. There's, there's nothing like that. So instead, we're going to look to days when officers are scheduled to moonlight uh, and work an off-duty job at the end of their regularly scheduled police uh, shift. When an officer is scheduled to moonlight, what that means is that the value of a late shift arrest has fallen. If you make that late shift arrest, you're, you're gonna get your, your three and a half hours of overtime pay, great, but that's gonna be deducted against what you would have earned in your off-duty job, right? So um, if officers are gonna, are gonna be responsive to their financial incentive, what we should see is that late shift arrests fall even more on days when an officer is about to work an off-duty job after their police shift. So we have all this data. We know if someone's working, you know, uh, Walmart, working security. We know if they're working um, for Mark Cuban when he throws a swanky party at his Dallas mansion. Um, it's really uh, pretty cool uh, data. Uh, we might even end up writing a descriptive paper just talking about police overtime. And so we're gonna focus on an officer's regular off-duty work. Uh, and we do this because of a little bit of uh, a weird um, feature of how the data gets recorded, uh, which we only became aware of when we started talking uh, more to police officers. So technically you have to ask permission uh, and then you know be approved to work off-duty. Uh, in practice, uh, that doesn't happen. There's a 2018 audit that found that basically officers were doing this and then they were just like putting in the hours two weeks later. They would, you know, um, report it after the fact. And so um, what that means is if we look at, at days when an officer actually works off duty, uh, it's going to be endogenous because it's, you know, that's going to be related to whether a late shift arrest was made. And so we're just going to focus on this regular off duty work, like every Tuesday evening, I'm working at Walmart, that kind of thing. Uh, so that and not Mark Cuban's uh, uh, swanky parties. Uh, so we're going to run really uh, a very similar regression. Uh, so o, the OD terms here are um, indications for, uh, they're indicator variables for um, off-duty work on that day. We're going to uh, interact that with a variable that captures whether the um, off-duty work was, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, whether an arrest was made early in an officer shift or late in an officer shift. So early meaning the first four hours and late meaning the last four hours. I'm going to run this regression separately for pre-shift off-duty work and post-shift off-duty work, because you're gonna make different predictions based on whether the officer already completed their work shift, their off-duty work shift, or whether that's gonna happen at the end of their police shift. And let me walk you through a little bit more of the logic of these, uh, these tests and what we hope to learn from them, and then I'll tell you what we find, which I think is pretty interesting. So on days when an officer works uh, a pre-shift off-duty job, and these pre-shift off-duty jobs are on average around four and a half hours long. Uh, there's really no particular reason to think that they would make fewer early shift arrests. Early shift arrests are relatively unlikely to lead to overtime. And so we can think of this kind of as a placebo test, right, for the, the correctness of our model. Um, it's not a pure placebo test, but it, I think it's reasonably close to a placebo test. Now, another thing you might be worried about, since we're trying to infer something about officers' underlying preferences, is that if I work up, uh, you know, towards the end of the day, maybe I'm just kind of tired. I'm, I'm losing the ability to make arrests. I'm, I'm 
kind of tired. I, I just feel like I can't do all the canvassing needed to find a suspect. And so that could be something that could explain our results, but that wouldn't necessarily reflect an officer's underlying preferences. So here we have a test for this. We can see if your late shift arrests fall even more on days where you've already worked your pre-shift off-duty job. So if you're at your, you know, your eighth hour of your police shift, that's really like the 13th hour you've worked that day, right, on average, or the 12th or 13th hour you've worked. And so if there's any kind of fatigue or ability loss, we should see uh, a further decline in arrests on those days. Now, we can also look at post-shift off-duty work. And what we would say is that if you're making fewer late shift arrests uh, on days when you are working um, a post-shift off-duty job, that's going to tell us something about how responsive you are to your financial incentives. So if, you're, if your arrest activity is declining throughout the day, ordinarily, but then it declines even more when you have this off-duty job to go to, we would say, ah, that officer's behavior is being distorted by financial incentives based uh, you know, on the job. So what do we find? For the pre-shift off-duty work, uh, we find really no impact on either early or late shift arrests uh, made um, by police officers. So this is minus 0.5%. It's not statistically significant. Our standard errors are very small. Uh, so, um, you know, this is, you can think of this as a very precise uh, null effect. Uh, so what do we see on days when officers are working uh, off duty um, after their police shift? Here, we actually um, do see some, some evidence of distortion. So we don't see anything like early shift arrest changing, which is consistent with what we would expect because early shift arrests are unlikely to lead to overtime. But we see a, an additional 4% decline in late shift arrests on days when an officer is going to be working off duty later on. So this is a 4% decline on top of the 28% decline that we observe normally. And so we can think of this as a modest uh, uh, level of responsiveness, right? We, we don't see that officers are like, oh, I've got an off-duty job. Yeah, hell no, I'm never making an arrest. But we are seeing some evidence of this response, which uh, we interpret as evidence that officers are um, corruptible in, in this particular way, um, that you know, they, they're, they're responding to the financial incentives that they face. Um, OK. So uh, at this point, I want to sort of uh, put this all together and say a little bit more about uh, what I think this evidence means. And we're going to do this in a very structured way. Uh, and then I'll editorialize a little bit. I'll use the, the speaker's bully pulpit and just you know, say what I think this means uh, kind of in more colloquial or, or policy terms. So um, we have uh, some conflicting evidence here, potentially, right? On the one hand, we see some pretty clear evidence that officers value their leisure time a lot. They value their leisure time at the margin more than they value that $150, right? And I, I sort of like to explain this to, to professors and grad students in the following way. It's like, you know, I go and teach a statistics class for three hours and I get back to my office. It's the end of the day. I'm packing up to go home, you know, uh, you know, dinner's being made, all that good stuff. And let's say my chair, uh, Greg Ridgway, runs into my office and says, hey, Aaron, I know you're getting ready to leave, but um, we've got some students who need a little bit more support in statistics. Um, can you stay, stay a couple of extra hours and, and you know, help work with them? Uh, by the way, they're, they're not like the most engaged students. They're a little annoying. And I'll give you 150 bucks if you do it, right? Uh, you can sort of see why uh, that might not seem like such an appealing uh, bargain. Maybe especially as you're as a uh, for a professor. Maybe for a grad student, your earnings are still a little lower. Uh, maybe that's that's a little bit more appealing. Uh, but you know, we're we're really seeing evidence uh, that officers um, value their leisure time and that they might shirk. On the other hand, we do see evidence that they are responsive to financial incentives because they're shirking more on days when they have this off-duty job to get to. And so I, I, I want to just put this together a little bit more. And so what we do is we build a, a pretty simple mathematical model of officer arrest decisions. So this is a model where officers can make uh, type one or type two errors in making an arrest. So they can falsely arrest someone who's innocent. They can fail to uh, arrest someone who's guilty. Uh, we assume that officers uh, don't 
know if someone's innocent or guilty, but that they observe a noisy signal of a suspect's guilt. And so officers are going to make the arrest if there's um, a threshold guilt probability that's met uh, with two added considerations. One is whether the officer has the opportunity to make further arrests. Um, so uh, early in the shift, the officer is going to have, you know, seven more hours uh, that they could use to make a, a, an arrest that's maybe better or more likely to lead to overtime. And based on when the, the arrest is made, we know that overtime probabilities change along with that. Early shift arrests, unlikely to lead to overtime pay. Late shift arrests, more likely to lead to overtime pay. Oops. So we build out this, this model. Um, I, I think in the amount of time I have, it's not worth going through it. It's, it's sort of a, a very simple heuristic model that accords with, um, you know, how I just described, uh, uh, you know, the process of making an arrest decision. Uh, it's a silly model in some ways, right? As all models are, they're not going to perfectly map onto the real world. But let me actually convince you that the silly, silly little model uh, is still useful. So in this figure, uh, which is drawn from the end of the paper, uh, the blue um, segments here, these are 95% confidence intervals that are that come from the empirical data that we observe. So these are from the regressions that we run. So you see that arrest probabilities rise throughout the shift and then fall. We see that court conviction rates rise throughout an officer shift, that the probability that an arrest leads to overtime rises throughout an officer shift. The red curves are simulated moments from our simple mathematical model. And you can see that, that our simple model fits the data almost perfectly. We recover from our simple model, the same pattern in arrest activity where arrests go up and then fall. We observe convictions rising and the rate of overtime rising. So uh, as simplified as any mathematical model has to be, uh, this model has the virtue of actually fitting the data in the real world. Um, and you know, we think there's some useful stuff that, that we can take out of it. And I wanna talk about two things in particular. Um, so first we can use our model to run some uh, policy counterfactuals. So here the y-axis is the arrest rate, uh, the uh, probability that a, an arrest is made in a given shift. The x-axis is the shift hour running from the first hour to the last hour. So for an officer who is overtime indifferent, who literally you know, is completely indifferent between working an overtime shift and not working an overtime shift, what we observe is that that officer is gonna have rising arrest activity throughout his or her shift. Now, interestingly, if I just ran the regressions and this is what I found, I would say, aha, officers make collars for dollars. This is a, a sign of corruption. But actually, this is the behavior that a completely officer, overtime and different officer is going to engage in. Why? What's the, what's the reason for this? Because if I make an arrest early in my shift, I forego the probability, the possibility of making a better arrest later in my shift. So I could arrest the guy for turnstile jumping in the first hour of my shift, but maybe I could have um, you know, had a better collar later in my shift. Uh, so this is actually behavior consistent with overtime indifference not with collars for dollars. Now the red curve, that's what we uh, observe from the model, which very closely accords with what we observe in the empirical estimates, which is that officers uh, uh, increase their arrest activity and then it falls uh, at the end of the day. Now what we do with the, with the blue curve is we triple their overtime pay, we, uh, or we triple their pay. So this is um, 3X instead of 1.5X uh, as their wage. And if, if they had 300% overtime pay instead of 150%, then we think they actually would make more late shift arrests. This represents the response to their financial incentive that, incentives that we observe when we look at their response to working post-shift off-duty work. Mm -hmm. And so the difference between the red line and the blue line is telling us how corruptible officers are by their financial incentives. And we think they're you know, a little bit corruptible, uh, but not a lot corruptible, at least along this, this margin. Uh, and and let, me, let me sort of say a little bit more about that. So what we can also do with this model is we can back out um, some interesting quantities. Uh, how much pay would an officer need to knowingly arrest an innocent person? And how much overtime pay would an officer need to fail to arrest a suspect who's known to be guilty? Now, this is pure extrapolation, right? Like these are not decisions that are made in the real world. Uh, but still, given that our simple model really does explain um, all of these dynamics that we uh, observe empirically, uh, maybe it's interesting to see what the model thinks um, 
uh, these uh, S demands are. And so um, I would take the numbers with a little bit of a grain of salt, uh, but what I would note is that these numbers are, um, you know, fairly large or maybe fairly small, depending on your, your priors and your normative beliefs about policing. Uh, so we think that an officer might make uh, a knowingly corrupt arrest for $3,500 or fail to arrest someone who's definitely guilty for about $8,000. Uh, maybe that's disturbing to you because like that's such a terrible thing to do, right? Both of these are terrible things to do. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is no arrest you could make that's going to lead to this amount of money in, in, in overtime pay. And so we think that, you know, in practice, uh, given how much officers value their leisure time relative to their financial incentives, uh, we really don't think collars for dollars is um, a story that's consistent with the preferences of uh, police officers. Um, okay, so to sort of sum up and, and do a little bit of editorializing now, uh, what do we think? Are officers professionally motivated? Uh, so on the one hand, we observe what, what I think of as evidence for shirking. Um, police officers, uh, a lot like other workers, uh, value uh, their leisure time. There's papers that look at what uh, how doctors um, do their jobs at the end of their shifts. So it turns out at the end of a doctor's shift, they order fewer tests. They spend less time with patients. Uh, they want to go home. Uh, now, they don't earn time and a half, uh, but, you know, they're still... Uh, something interesting there. Uh, and we also see that even arrests for serious crimes, felonies, are falling at the end of an, off an officer shift. So if I get a 911 call for a serious crime, uh, I show up, I'm less likely to end up making an arrest if I'm at the end of my shift than I'm, if I'm at the beginning of my shift. And so we think both of these are evidence for shirking. This is, uh, you know, probably suboptimal behavior uh, by police officers. Um, so yeah, we think cops are, are, are a lot like other people. Um, and, you know, this might explain why uh, you see uh, police command uh, starting, you know, maybe in the 90s uh, into the early 2000s, trying to explicitly incentivize officers to make as many stops and as many arrests as possible, right? Not saying that that's a good thing, right? It's a, you know, very damaging thing in a lot of circumstances, but you can kind of understand why a police commander might want to do that if they think their cops are just a little bit lazy and they shirk. Sure right? It just explains the, you know, uh, why we see this. Uh, on the other hand, right, we do see some evidence for professional motivation. So officers don't appear to make uh, socially undesirable arrests in exchange for more money, uh, at least with respect to this particular type of overtime pay. And even though we see felony arrests fall at the end of an officer shift, we think that there's some evidence that officers are responding by abating the lowest quality arrests. So, they're abating arrests that are less likely to lead to a conviction, less likely to lead to a custodial sentence, and they're more likely to abate uh, arrests that are for violations and misdemeanors than they are arrests that are felonies. And so we think of this as evidence that officers um, do uh, display some professional motivation towards their work and, and wanting to do a good job. Uh, so we think this is a mixed bag. Uh, I, I think my big conclusion from this, and uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people I've talked to agree uh, based on their observations um, that officers are are more like other people than many people believe. Um, some some you know some of them are are highly professionally motivated, others uh, less so. Um, and uh, you know we hope to sort of continue along this path and and do more research um, along these lines. One thing that I, I'd particularly like to do is, uh, to find a city um, where officers' pensions are are pegged to how many, uh, how much money they worked in the last three years of their of their uh, careers. So in Dallas, overtime doesn't count towards your pension, but in New York, it does. And so you sort of wonder, are officers going to be strategically trying to get overtime because now this is going to increase their pay for the rest of their lives, right? Uh, so that's something I'd like to look at. But I mean, it's so hard to get all this data from, uh, you know, we have to get it from the police department, from the courts. Uh, so it's just really a huge uh, investment. Um, uh, so thank you. Uh, if you have um, questions or comments you want to share via email, this is my email address. You could also CC Felipe, who I'm sure would love to hear from you uh, as well. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Aaron, for being with us today. Um, I We have an open Q&A if anyone wants to send in a question via the chat.
um, Joy and Stace, you're going to be monitoring that. I, I wanted to ask the first uh, first question here, and I think you kind of explained this, but I'm not sure I grasped it. Okay, so we see that curve going up in the middle of their shift and then coming down. And you said that you could account or kind of take out the fact that those arrests in the middle shift might mean now they're incapacitated from future arrests because they're doing the paperwork. Um, so I just wanted to know if you could explain that that a bit more to me, because I know you said you accounted for it, but I don't think I quite grasped it. Yeah, so we actually did two things. Uh, so the first thing we did was just really simple. We focused on officers who only made one arrest uh, in their shift, and we see the same thing. But then the really big thing we do is we say, well, um, let's focus on uh, a data set where the rows, the unit of observation is the 911 call. And so all of these are 911 calls that are you know, being responded to by officers. And we look at the probability that that 911 call led to an arrest. So if the officer was responding to a 911 call, the officer could not have been incapacitated by an earlier arrest. They could have made an earlier arrest and they're back out on the job, uh, but they're they're available. And so um, by by focusing on the 911 calls, we can rule out that this is an incapacitation story. Okay, thank you. I knew I know you said you addressed. It, I just didn't catch how, but I do have new information, which is if I want to commit a crime, I want to do it towards the end of the officer's shift so that they need a higher probability of guilt to arrest me. So that's yeah. I think <laughs> that, I think that, that's that my takeaway be, message, Aaron. That could be a takeaway. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, de depending on who you are and what you do, that could absolutely be a takeaway. Um, it's actually an interesting paper uh, by um, Giovanni Mastroboni, who's a Italian researcher. He um, observed that in Milan, uh, there's this weird thing where the uh, local police um, shift from quadrant to quadrant uh, based on the hour of the day. And then like the Carbonieri, which is sort of the national police take over in one of the quadrants of the city. And so at certain times of the day, all the cops are like driving from one quadrant to the other quadrant. And so the, the probability of an arrest falls like by 80% in this 20 or 30 minute window. Uh, so a really interesting natural experiment. Uh, Dallas is ahead of the game. They have these overlapping shifts, which right, right. are great for our paper and also probably really good for policing as well. Okay, so I will turn it over to other Q and A's from our participants and viewers. Uh, Joy or Stacy, I don't know which one of you wants to. I have two. One that says I might have missed this, but did suspect characteristics affect the likelihood of officers making late shift arrests? Yeah, great. So great question. So we, uh, what I what I um, presented today very, very quickly, I think I spent 15 seconds in the slide, is that when you look at suspect race, uh, arrestee race, uh, that does not vary throughout an officer's shift. So officers are equally likely to arrest Black or Hispanic people early in the shift versus late in the shift. Uh, we also did this for age. We didn't see anything uh, there. Uh, we also went really deep down the rabbit hole and we said, all right, can we find officers in the data who kind of conform to the signature uh, that, that Collars for Dollars might suggest? So we looked for officers who were making uh, lower quality rest at the end of the shift, uh, in particular for people who were Black or Hispanic, um, and, uh, and, and sort of like less, for less serious crimes in particular, so more for misdemeanors and for felonies. And we could only find like five or six officers in the data that we're kind of conforming to that overall pattern. Now, you know, we're it's a noisy process once you start looking at individual officers. So we don't want to make a strong claim that only five or six guys in the whole police force were doing this. But it's just even when you're we're, when you're sort of looking for this type of behavior at the individual officer level, there's so few officers who are ramping up their arrests at the end of the day. It's really um, it's a big effect that we're observing that that uh, late shift arrests are, are not desirable. We have another question. Findings seem to show that police workplace deviance is small. How com how does this compare to other occupations? Really interesting. So, um, yeah, I think what I would say based on this research and just a lot of other research on police, right, is that police officers tend to do what they're told, right? So there's research, a uh, paper I really like by John Mumolo, who's a political scientist who do who's done work in policing, uh, where he looks at um, what happens when there's a union memo, um, kind of warning officers, uh, you know, to be careful and and you know not do bad things in the job, and you observe, you know, changes in complaints. Uh, there's a paper by Bokar Ba that that sort of sees uh, 
uh, uh, comes up with a similar conclusion. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think officers uh, will will kind of um, respond to the incentives that they're given. So when uh, commanders are saying make a lot of stops, officers make a lot of stops. When commanders say don't make as many stops, they don't make as many stops. Uh, with respect to this sort of shirking behavior, there are studies uh, in labor economics of, of doctors, of other shift workers, uh, and they sort of tend to find the same thing, uh, that later in um, people shifts, uh, they're kind of checking out uh, a little bit early. Uh, I talked about the example with doctors. Uh, in that example, actually, patient care suffers. So if you go in and you're seen by a physician at the end of the day, fewer tests, uh, the doctor spending less time with you, and um, health outcomes actually look to be a little bit worse uh, on that basis. So um, uh, I would say, based on the research I'm aware of, um, officers look uh, like other workers, even workers that are not supervised in quite the same way. Uh, next question. Do you think these results would replicate for other policing outcomes, e.g. stop and frisk or use of force? Really interesting. So this is something that's on our plate to look at. We have uh, all of the data on um, use of force. We, we don't have the stops right now, but I think we could get the stops. Um, my sense is that for the stops, we're going to see what we see for the arrests, simply because when we condition on a 911 call, we see some, kind of the same thing that we see overall. So I think that's going to indicate that um, uh, police proactivity and, you know, as proxy by stops will, will probably fall similarly, but I don't know. Uh, I, it, it, this is a reminder that we really should uh, unpack that use of force data and see uh, what we can find. And I think there's two ways to look at that. One is that if you make fewer arrests and you're less proactive, use of force should decline. But then on a sort of a per call basis, does use of force go up or down, right? That that could be interesting. We could also use our, our off-duty work um, uh, data to look at this. When officers are like in the 16th hour that they worked that day, are they more likely to use force uh, when they make an arrest or something like that, or less likely? Um, that That's something else we can do. A few more. How do you account for the difference between moonlighting and police work in terms of officers' preference other than the financial, financial incentives? For example, they enjoy more in some aspects of the post-shift work. Yeah. Oh, this is a great question. So um, I think there's a huge difference, right? So um, off-duty work uh, is planned, right? I know that I'm going to do this on Tuesday night. I'm not making other plans. Um, it's not as dirty uh, as sitting in a jail that smells bad and, you know, you're like adrenaline is up because you just chased a suspect. Um, what we what we think is true from just anecdotal um, uh, conversations and also some other research is that officers you know, don't mind court overtime. They don't mind planned overtime, uh, working overtime for a parade or something like that, like St. Patrick's Day. Uh, what they don't like is overtime that is unplanned and especially unpleasant. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to make any claims that off-duty work and overtime police work are, are fungible uh, in terms of like, um, you know, they both contribute equally to officer preferences. The, the only thing I would want to claim is that on days when you have this off-duty work that you're planning to do, the, the cost of making an arrest changes. Uh, so I wouldn't want to make any kind of claim about fungibility there, uh, just to be clear. I have a long one here. What if the curve goes up and down during an early and late shift? It's what's normal shift behavior and the line is going straight up is the not normal behavior. What if the line going straight up is the police officer doing more arrests later in the shift is that that's the ab abnormal behavior just so that they can make more money without putting in the extra time. I may have missed it, but how does one know that too many arrests are not overdoing it? Yeah, I, I think, um, I think this, this sort of just, like, I wouldn't want to overclaim here because I think there's just a normative question. Like, I don't know how many arrests would be optimal for police to make, right? So on the one hand, um, you know, people could claim that when officers shirk and they make fewer arrests, uh, you know, you're going to reduce the deterrence value of policing. Uh, that's going to have consequences, especially for people living in disadvantaged communities who are exposed to more uh, crime. On the other hand, right, we know that when first-time offenders in particular uh, are exposed to prosecution, uh, you know, they're, we know, at least from some cities, they're more likely to end up reoffending. 
So I think the question of like what the optimal number of arrests are, are or like under what conditions police should make an arrest feels like it would be very hard to back out using, using research. I, I think, you know, I, I would only want to go so far as to say, um, you know, because officers are, are doing less of this at the end of their shift re relative to the rest of their shift, it does feel like, like a signature shirking to me. Whether this is a good thing, arrest making, uh, police making fewer arrests in general, you know, people in the audience might view it that way. They might say, like, good, I'm glad officers shirk because arrests uh, impose a lot of social costs. Uh, but if that were the case, if that was just sort of like an optimal response, we would expect to see, um, wouldn't expect to see this like, you know, extra reduction at the end of the shift. I, I hope I'm answering uh, your question. Is there any data that you have found on arrests made at the end of the month rather than at the end of the day? I'm curious about the phenomenons of police officers' performance goals or quotas. I would assume that the number would, of arrests would be much higher at the start of the month. Really interesting. So we could look at this. We actually have not thought to look at this, so I appreciate the question. At the end of um, the month rather than at the start of the month. At the month start of the month, yeah. So we could look at this. I, I kind of suspect that if we had data from like New York City in 2003, we would totally find evidence of this, right? Because police officers were just being so incentivized to make stops and arrests. I, I've been told by people who were cops at that time, like I would just like say hi to someone in the street. They would say hi back and I'd, I'd write that up as a stop, you know? Uh, you know, I, I should have mentioned this. These are data from 2015 to 2019. I, I don't know why I didn't say that during the talk, but I, I do wonder whether... Um, you know, I think policing's changed a lot in the last 10, 15 years, and I wonder whether we uh, waited too long uh, to be able to observe that. But we can look at that empirically, and uh, if we find something, I, I feel like that could be uh, another paper, right? So I don't know whose question that was, but um, if you if you want to shoot me an email and chat more, that that's a really interesting idea. Another one. Again, what does research tell us about workspace deviance in the occupation, especially in blue collar occupations? Yeah, so I, I, I don't, I'm not an expert, right, in, in sort of uh, labor markets writ large. Um, and so I, I don't know that I can really provide a great answer to this question. Um, I, I think the best I could do is to say that um, uh, yeah, you know what? I, I, I think I, I should just um, shut up and not answer questions that I can't answer well. Uh, but if anyone uh, is available, if someone in the audience feels like they have a good answer to that question, um, please chime in. I, I really feel like I can only speak about police officers. You don't have to answer all the questions. It's fine. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I have one. My best, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to know when to quit. And another, I may have missed this, but can you control for self-selection into which officers are more likely to moonlight? I think you included the individual level fixed effects, but I can't remember. Yeah, so officer fixed effects are in here. Um, I, I think it's very clear that there would be some selection here. One thing I really wanted to get, but that we can't get is like how, um, whether officers are married or not, whether they have kids or not, things that could plausibly shift the value of, of uh, leisure time, you know, who's working overtime. So we can't get at some of the more subtle stuff. Uh, we just sort of say like, look, we're going to condition on these officer fixed effects. Um, and we're going to focus on the subset of officers who um, who do work overtime at some point during uh, this, this period, which is about half of the officers. Um, so that could raise an external validity concern. Like we're able to make this claim for the half of the police department uh, who have expressed some interest in financial rewards apart from what they get in their jobs. I think maybe one claim, you, one, one hypothesis you could have is that uh, these will be the people who are uh, more responsive to financial incentives than the other 50%. And so if anything, maybe our estimates are um, uh, conservative in that sense, uh, but uh, maybe that's too strong a claim. And that's all the questions that we have in our Q&A. Megan, would you like to add anything as we depart? I'm sorry, I was having trouble getting reconnected there to my uh, audio. No, I just would like to thank Aaron so much for this talk. It's been very, just that the data that you've collected is amazing. I'm always, you, you start out by saying sometimes no one has perfect data, but you really kind of did have perfect data here for what you want to do. 
And I, one of my potential questions was one that was asked about the beginning and end of month. So I think there's a lot of more interesting things here to be explored. And I hope that our students and faculty are inspired to engage with you on this as you continue this important work. Thank you. Yeah, if, if anyone has ideas, like we've got so much data sitting around, like it's ridiculous how much we have, including stuff we haven't used. So if you have ideas, shoot me an email. Um, uh, I'm too busy to write papers myself, but uh, I always uh, seek out co-authors. Uh, so let me know. Students, please hear that. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your time and for attending this, the third of our four um, criminology forms. The semester, I forgot to say in the beginning, they're supported through the Department of Sociology and Criminology and the Criminal Justice Research Center. And we have one more upcoming. Joy, can you remind us of the dates when Christopher Dumb is presenting? That would be on Blue White Friday. That's uh, April. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> April 14th. It'll be a, a great presentation. He's an ethnographics, uh, and he studies sex offenders, exiled in America, life on the margins in a residential motel. All right, thank you so much. Hopefully we'll see you all back then. And thank you, Dr. Chaplin, again for your time today. Thanks guys, thanks for the invite. Enjoy your weekend.